This is my favorite place in the church. <laughs> and and, and I'm, I'm happy to tell you that, that my ministration to this facility, as in this tank, is working. <laughs> it is good to keep the water in, but I'm telling you I'm so thankful for the water of life today, and I'm thankful that this church family has had in it individuals like Richard Guy, Dr. Richard Guy, who is with me today, dressed in his Pathfinder uniform appropriately because the Pathfinder program in this church is alive and well. And if you don't know what Pathfinders is, you really should. And if you're not old enough for Pathfinders, know too that we have adventurers as well for you if you would like. But you and your parents would have to ask. We're not going to do it unless you ask. How's that? Is that naughty? Church family, do you think we should just do it because we should do it? Or do you think we should do it only if they'll come? What a question, hey? This is the place where we say to ourselves, what on earth are we going to do without Jesus? This is the place where we say to ourselves, I have decided to follow Jesus, which, by the way, is exactly why the Pathfinders are in existence. What's the first class of Pathfinders? Friend. Friend of who? Friend of God. Companion. Explorer. This is why we teach our children this, because we would like them to get to know Jesus a lot, lot better. So we have two candidates today for baptism. They have decided to come in. I want to thank Travis, who helped to fill the tank. I want to thank, thank Jack for also helping. The water is warm because of their ministrations this morning. Thank you. That's very kind of you. We, we would have been in trouble without you. We're going to do this baptism, and then we're going to uh, have people come and talk about their feelings about these kids and about Jesus. Or should we, should, should we have them come first? Okay. Mom? Dad? Brother Hinkle? If you like, you're welcome. I don't know about you, but this is exciting. Good morning. Good morning, church family. Good morning. Um, we are extremely ha happy and joyful um, for you know um, for our children, and because uh, they will be getting baptized today, and they'll be dedicating their life uh, to our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, <clears throat> It has been 12 years since I first gave birth to Alexandra. And um, time has gone by very quickly. And, and then this one. <laughs> yeah, and then, and then Jonathan, nine years. <laughs> um, I'm extremely happy that they're both, they both decided to take this, this decision together and uh, for the praise and the honor to God. Uh, <clears throat> um, one thing that I want them to remember is that um, we will always stand near you guys. We will always support you, encourage you, and cheer you on and advise you throughout your whole life. But most important, um, our Heavenly Father will always be there for you, for you guys always to consult in good times and in bad times. He will never forsake you, and, and this is priceless. He loves you and always wishes the best for you, too. Thank you. Amen. Morning. It's kind of like a nervous to be in front of everybody and, and trying to remember what you're going to say, you know, 
but it's really, really exciting, you know, especially for us, you know, being um, their fathers, uh, trying to, you know, guide them and everything, but more happy for us to, you know, um, know that our Heavenly Father, now it's going to be even more taking care of them, and, and especially in this step that they're going to they're gonna do now. Uh, it's a very, very, very blessing for us to, to be in and having this opportunity to be here and sharing with them what is going to happen from now on in the future that, um, that them is going to have a, now a big family, you know, which is everybody witnesses right now. Thank you very much for everything. And thanks, God, for all the, the stuff that gave it to us until now. Amen. A little while ago, we advertised the opportunity for classes for baptism. And uh, uh, Milton and Denise, teachers of our middle school and high school classes, stepped up and said, we will, we will be the ones to do this class. And I want you to know that that meant a huge amount to me because Milton is our head elder. And he is saying, as the leader of this church, I feel that it is important that we take care of our young people and that we give them the opportunity to know Jesus as well and as possible. And Denise, too, she's been uh, r raising her own kids in this church and now is saying, for the rest of the kids in this church, we need the same thing. So I just wanted to give you an opportunity if you wanted to say anything at this moment. Otherwise, uh, I know that Grandma Jo is very happy to be here because, of course, <laughs> she, knew, she knew these ones uh, when they were just uh, tiny, tiny. Just, just a, uh, a thank you for the weeks that we spent together, the joy you gave Denise and I, the education you gave Denise and I, and we stand here today in celebration and praise God for, are you seeing me, Jonathan? Your, your decisions to follow Jesus, it means a lot, so. This occasion, these children being baptized, is the one reason I stick with Sabbath school and teach them every week, because I love seeing the joy on their face on a day like today. Amen. We're very proud of you. Amen. Amen. I had the privilege of having these babies in my class, showing them God's love, my love. You always belong to me. You always belong to Jesus. Trust him. Follow him. I love you. Every few months, we have the joy of doing a baby dedication in this congregation. And part of what goes on at a baby dedication is the parents effectively saying to all of us as a church family, we trust you. But it's more than the parents saying we trust you. It's the parents saying, help us. Together we are committing to raise our children in this whole big family. So while Today we're taking a formal step of following the baptism, admitting them into the family. Obviously they've been a part of our family and for those of you that have been here for nine years, 12 years, more or less, what have we done together? We have raised these children in the way of God. Amen. So that's what we're celebrating today. That's what all of those of us who are in children's ministries celebrate week after week and hope that what we are doing and pray that what we're doing is raising our children together in God. Amen. I've asked Richard to be here because in many respects I see this as a joint effort of us as a congregation, as a, a, a representative of the church that has been uh, given leadership. I'm saying that leadership also extends to all of us as parents and adults in this church is to lead our children to the feet of Jesus. 
And so uh, Richard represents you today as well as me, because uh, I know that, that baptizing my own kids was probably one of the greatest things that I ever participated in as well. So thank you. Thank you for letting him do that for you today. All right. Your choice. Birth order or are you going first? You're going first? Let me just, let me just, let, 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 let. Do you want to just say, I love Jesus? Do you want to, do you want to have them hear you say that? No, don't touch it. <laughs> it's wireless, but it's still. It's wireless, but still. I'll do. I love Jesus. Amen. <laughs> How do you feel, Alexandra? Good. Happy to be here. I'm blessed. Amen. 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 Sure. How should we do this? I'm just going to do it right here because we have enough water in here, let me tell you. And I told them Amen. all they have to do is bend at the knee like all of us have to do in the presence of God. Jonathan, because you have decided to follow Jesus all your life, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, His Son Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. you're going to be tall, very beautiful like your mom. And so thank you so much for leading in your, your generation in this. May there be many of your friends that follow. Alexandra, because of your love for Jesus and your decision to follow him for all of your life, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We're going to continue with our service now, and in a moment I will kind of flip us all into a business meeting. At that moment I will be receiving a motion, and in a second, and uh, you'll get an opportunity based on their decision to be baptized by immersion today as to whether or not you would like them to be members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So be watching for that. Let us pray for a moment here. Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to be in your presence, to witness what you have done in the lives of the Rodriguez family, that they have led their children to this place, and that those children who are now old enough to understand for themselves have said, yes, we want to be a Jesus boy, we want to be a Jesus girl forever and ever. God in heaven, please bless them. Cause them to be a shining light for you in this community, we pray. And we know that this will be done in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. As a church, the Seventh-day Adventists believe in baptism by immersion. So we have a baptistry. But we also constitute a worldwide fellowship of individuals who are believing that Jesus is coming soon and that living by the statutes, the laws that he has asked us to as creator God, we have the opportunity to worship him on Sabbath. So that's why we call ourselves Seventh-day Adventists. So when people get baptized, 
the next thing that happens is to ask them whether or not they would like to be part of this missionary organization known as the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's uh, something that we should think about because what they did here was to say that they love Jesus and they accept him as their personal savior. And that is what anybody says when they get baptized. We recognize that in the Seventh-day Adventist Church and invite people who are committed to Jesus first to join us. So that's why I'm making this distinction this morning. It's very important because what you are about to do is the superpower of the local church. No other part of the church can invite people into the church and offer them membership but you. So I'm going to flip you into business mode at the moment and I'm going to uh, entertain a motion to accept. So moved. so moved. So you understand what is happening at this moment. You are asking to become part of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You understand that, right? He just said, let's do it. Anyone else want to say let's do it? Amen. So there's a second. Okay, so then we vote. It's by vote of the membership of the church. So if you're a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church today in the hearing of my voice and would like to invite or endorse the invitation to have these two young people join the Seventh-day Adventist Church, would you raise your hand? And since we're in business meeting, I have to ask, is there anyone opposed? Is there anyone who says, no, we shouldn't do it? Because you have a right to say that. Okay. I guess everybody wants to have you as part of the Adventist Church. Congratulations. Let me shake your hand for the first time. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. This family has said we are interested in being part of the mission of this church. And I tell you what, we need a lot more people. And why? Because guess what? They have friends that I don't have. And as we do our mission, that is my reason. If ever I ask you why you should join the Adventist church or why somebody else should join the Adventist church, now you know the answer I'm looking for. It's because you have friends that I don't have. And I am going to my friends, and you are going to your friends, and that's how Jesus says that this will all wind up, is if we go to our friends and tell them, Jesus is coming soon, I'd love for you to come to heaven with me. See what they say. See what they say. Now, the Rodriguez family has two more individuals who are officially doing that. They've been doing it unofficially all their life, but now they're officially recognized. And this is a wonderful thing. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's hear from the Word of God now as we have our call, as, a, as we have our text. Thanks, guys, for scripture reading. Thank you so much. This scripture reading can be found in Psalms 37, 1 through 6. Do not fret because of those who are evil, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither, like the green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy the safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you all the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, and your vindication like the noonday sun. In the moments we have remaining, which my countdown clock says 10 minutes and 57 seconds. So isn't it lovely to know that I have a countdown clock now? <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Birker, for, for your help with this. I want us to concentrate on what exactly just happened. We just saw two young people commit themselves. It's somewhat like a marriage in the sense that years ago as they were sitting at their mom's knee, at, as they were sitting on their dad's lap and they were being told stories about Jesus and they, their, their idea of Jesus grew and grew and grew, they came to the place where when they were asked, would you like to commit? They said yes. They said yes. Commitment is, is about 
a, a relationship. It's, it's about making sure that you are in connection, making sure that you know just about as much as possible about what you are committing to and or whom you are committing to. It would be, uh, well, it is. It seems crazy to us, especially uh, to some of us uh, with a little bit of marriage under our belts, to think of the fact that in years past, it was the custom that moms and dads might introduce you to your future spouse, and you would trust them to make a lifelong commitment to an individual. In many cultures today, in fact, probably some of, some of you in this very room have indeed uh, gotten married. You have made a commitment based on your trust and your faith in what your parents thought was going to be good for you. I know that uh, I was indeed grateful when my daughter decided to come to an appointment that had been set up between a couple of families. And I'm indeed grateful that my son-in-law decided not to take a nap that Sabbath afternoon. Because his friends had said, hey, there's this girl that we grew up with that you should meet. And so it was, and so it was that, that they met that afternoon, and uh, uh, a week later he came to Seattle and he, he uh, you know, started the courtship dance. My daughter decidedly was cautious. And so the dance lasted probably a little longer than he anticipated. <laughs> but they have been married over a year now, and I, if they are seeing this, I say, hi, guys, I'll see you in a few days. I'm enjoying the fact that Americans have a different Thanksgiving to Canadians, except for the fact that they have to go to work, and so I won't get to see them for very long. But I'm going to be thankful up in Canada. I hope you don't mind. God gets together with us in the same way. He draws us to himself. He then reminds us of his love repeatedly. Uh, would you hear that maybe in the fourth commandment? Remember the Sabbath day. If you think of it, the Sabbath was God's wedding present to Adam and Eve. And he's reminding them of the time when they got married in the Garden of Eden. And he's saying, remember, guys, I love you. I love you. I gave you, I gave you, the first thing that I gave you was rest. The first thing that I gave you was joy. The first thing that I gave you was a relationship with me. Remember, he, he reminds us. And then he promises us, as we've just heard in this text, that he will delight in us. And he loves it when we delight in him. In return for the way in which he comes to us asking for a relationship, he would love a few things in return. In this text here, we see in Psalm 37, it says, do not fret. And yes, I know you're thinking of a guitar right now, and a guitar has frets on it. Okay? It is the same word, but it has a very different meaning. Don't be Afraid, don't be anxious. He invites us not to fret. He invites us to believe that we cannot make it on our own. Now I know that that's, that sounds like a very un-American thing to say, especially here in California where we, we have stories and we have, still have the mentality that we come to this place to to find our fortune and, and to make it on our own. You know how they talk about making it in Hollywood. Jesus comes to us and, and, and he says, you know, in, in the relationship that I would like to have with you, I need you to know that you can try. You can try, but, but you're going to find out very quickly that you will not be able to do this on your own. I'm going to need to help you. I'm going to need to be there. So then the very next thing that he says is that you will trust in the Lord and that you will do good. You will dwell in the land and enjoy safe, safe pasture. So he says, please, 
understand that I'm going to protect you. You're going to be, you're going to be together with me and I'm going to protect you. Please know that, that you will be safe. And that you can do good. Now, when Jesus was called good master, good teacher, what was his response? There, yeah, why do you call me good? What, what, what are you doing calling me good? And then he says, because there is only one who is good. So here God is saying through David, the, the psalmist, he's, he's like a prophet here. He says that you will trust in the Lord and do good. In other words, as you have a relationship with God, the things that God would do, the way that he would act, the way that he would do things comes out of you as well. Trust in the Lord and you will. Maybe my emphasis. You will do good because God is good. And then my favorite part, it's, it's underlined in bright fluorescent green in my Bible. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And I have, I have tumbled this text around a lot of times in my life and said, if the Bible also says that my heart is wicked, <laughs> and it is, uh, then, then how is it that God can give me the delights, the desires of my heart? Wouldn't those be wicked desires? And the answer comes back, no, because I am now going to be together with you. And so I'm going to just change the, the pronoun there and say that I will give you the desires of our, of our heart. Because with God living with us, with God together with us, having made the choice, having made the commitment to having God in our lives, His desires become our desires. The good that we do is because He is a part of our lives. He says very definitely that your righteousness, see, you commit, you commit your way to the Lord, you trust in Him, and He will do this. He will make this happen. And he will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. And he's using this pronoun of you, you, you all the time. But this is because now we are in relationship with our Heavenly Father. And as our situation becomes brighter and brighter and our good deeds are seen before men, who gets the glory? It is the one who causes all of this to happen within us because we have committed to let him change the things that need to be changed, to emphasize the things that need to be emphasized, to give us the opportunity through the twists and turns of our lives to trust him, to trust him to change. You know, uh, this week I had to be reminded and I also reminded others the fact that I cannot change myself. I cannot, I cannot cause myself to do the things sometimes that I want to do. I don't have enough power in my life to do that. And you say, oh, but pastor, you know, how, how can you not have self-control? I'm telling you, self-control is only worth it if God is part of you. Because if you think that you can do stuff in your life through self-control, uh, you're going to find a lot of failure. I, I don't know, that's been my experience. And so therefore I would say, commit your ways to the Lord, say yes to Him, and see, see where it goes each day. Commit your ways to the Lord. In England, I had the opportunity because my mother loved to swim, of going to the baths. And I, I may have mentioned this before, but I, I was young, kind of like Jonathan at the time, and it was my desire to jump off of the five-meter board. <laughs> yeah, yeah, about as high as the roof of the church. Okay, with a 12-foot pool underneath, that looks even further because it's clear. And when you look from the top to the bottom, you're looking that extra 12 feet to the bottom of the pool. So it looks higher. 
But one day, I, I was nudging my brother, and we were, we were daring each other, and so I decided this is going to be the day. This is going to be the day. I had played on the one-meter board, and I had played on the three-meter board, but this was going to be the day. And so we climbed up these steps, which were not, not slanted, but they were like escape steps. I had to get up to this top concrete meter, five-meter platform dive. We went to the edge, we looked over, we went back from the edge, <laughs> we went to the edge again and we looked over. Now the rule was you weren't allowed to jump, you had to dive, you had to go in the water head first, that was the rule. If you jumped, they'd pull you out of the dive area. So what we did next was we sat down on the edge, now our legs are hanging over the edge. <laughs> We're looking down, and still it's not any closer. And so we turned over on our belly, and we hung. We hung from the five-meter board, and then we let go. That was how I got off the five-meter board the first time, was by inching my way over, inching my way over, sitting down, and then slowly getting closer and closer to the water so it wasn't so high, so it wasn't so scary. But what was motivating me was my desire to fly. I don't know if any of you like that feeling. Maybe you don't. Maybe that's what's the stuff of your, your nightmares, is flying through the air uncontrollably. Well, in this case, it would be controlled because you decided to do it. But eventually, eventually, I was able to get to the very back of the five-meter board and ask my brother to stand at the base in the, other, in the side of the pool at the bottom so that I would know that it was safe, that there was nobody underneath me because I wasn't there at the edge watching myself. And I would run. I would run from the back of the five-meter board and I would launch out. And I would be weightless for about three seconds. Had to learn to land properly because water's hard. Water's very hard on your head if you don't have the proper hands over so that you can cut the water open and, and, and go in. But I never would have had that experience in my life if I had not first decided to make the commitment, to make the commitment to, to jump off. Because once you jump off, once you go, there's no going back. I mean, in the movies, we can rewind. And the guy that's falling off goes back on. Okay? But you can't do that in real life. And so again today, I'm asking you. I'm asking myself. I think it's time that we made a new, renewed, full commitment to Jesus Christ. At this moment when we are looking into the eyes of our children at Christmas time, when we're teaching them about the coming Savior, we need to make this commitment ourselves and we need to say, this same Jesus who was here on this earth is, is coming back and he's coming back, it would seem, very soon. In our lifetime, we hope. Don't we say in the new year, in the year of our Lord? That's a very hopeful statement. It could mean this could be the year, right? This could be the year. So maybe it will be the year. But let me tell you, for those who, who did not make it out of the fire, the campfire, or for those who did not make it out of that nightclub the other night, it was the end. The next thing they will know is Jesus coming. So beware, Adventist. Beware that you don't realize that because of Jesus, the life that he is asking for us to live in the here and now is also part of our eternal life. When, when Alex and Jonathan accepted Jesus as their personal savior from sin, their eternal life began. They were written into the Lamb's book of life. As are your names if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Your name is written there. You, like the old song say, is my, yes, your name is written there. 
And it's written there in the blood of Jesus Christ. It's because of him that it is written there. Claim that. Live that. Live the incarnational life in the name of Jesus who taught us how to do that. Live the incarnational life so that you and I, one day, when the big change comes, because folks, that's all it is. When Jesus comes, he's going to change us in the twinkling of an eye. When that big change comes, we will know him because we know him now and because we made a commitment to him now, even when we cannot see him, that by faith we are saved, not of our own doing, but because of Jesus Christ. Yes or no? Yes? Yes. Amen.